Okay, so uh, any questions before we get started? If not, uh, I want to actually make an announcement that uh, remember we say we'll have uh, another uh, the second extra point. So right now I should post all these things on the teams. Okay, so all you do is actually go to the course evaluation and then finish that uh, evaluation so you can actually, once you're done with that, it will show the complete evaluation time. So screenshot that, okay, convert it into PDF file and then upload to the Microsoft Teams. Okay, so that I will know that you actually upload, you finish that and then upload it. Then you can actually use that as a vector to give you the uh, extra points. Okay, so this thing will be due next Friday midnight. So make sure you actually do all this evaluation early or not. Okay, so any questions for this? Okay, so if not, then uh, the things we're going to do this week is actually the first round and can finish in chapter 18 today. Uh, when I say finish in chapter 18, it means actually finish all the content that you need to know for chapter 18. Okay, 
which was originally designed to be presented or to be taught uh, next week. Okay, but I'm going to have it all today. Okay, and then we're going to go through the uh, reviews. Okay, so you should see all these review hangouts on Microsoft Teams as well. Okay, and then I would strongly suggest that, okay, so to prepare, okay, by now you, you should kind of see how the, um, how the course was designed, okay, to test your knowledge, right? And then we actually went through a lot of questions, okay. Based on my experience in, in the past seven years, okay, the way I teach you should be actually the, probably actually the easiest way to actually get to the uh, answer quickly. Okay, so I strongly suggest that you go through those uh, examples first. Okay, and then if you see some conflicts between my methodology to fiber footer program you participate, okay, stick to mine. Okay, because I have recording over there, right? If I teach you this way and you did not get the correct answers, I should be responsible for that. Okay, and the way I say I'm going to be responsible is that, okay, if you can let me see, you're actually following the way I teach you to do, and you cannot get the correct answer, it's my fault. You gotta point back. Okay, not partial credit, full credit for that. Okay, so let me suggest that I just follow the way I do, and then, Use that as the approach to handle your uh, midterm three and the final. All right. So the main um, flow of today is actually we finish the second part of chapter 18. Go through a few examples. Then we'll actually jump to the review hangout for the midterm three. We'll actually first discuss the questions for chapter 18. And then we'll jump back to chapter 16. Okay. Um, Thursday, we're going to use the whole lectures talking about the questions you're going to see for chapter 17. Okay, so that will be actually the design for this week. Coming week, which is next week, right? So we're going to go through the things that you encounter for your midterm two and midterm one. Okay. But basically, we'll only focus on midterm two because all the things you learn from midterm one is the preparation for the midterm two. Okay, for the midterm one, we actually start to teach you what is the concentration, right? So later on in midterm two, it becomes so fundamental that everybody will actually get it. Okay, so we'll basically focus a lot more on the uh, midterm two, which is actually mainly the calculation of pH of the solution. Right, so we're going to go back to those equation, okay? How do we actually calculate the pH of a uh, strong acid, strong base, weak acid, weak base, and buffer solution? Okay, so those are the things we're going to go through mainly for the next week, okay? And then if we have time, then I guess I want to actually also give you some my personal um understanding about okay when you apply for the graduate schools okay what are the personality or qualities that they're actually looking for so that you know you guys are mainly in the first year right that means means that you still have three more years to prepare yourself before you really actually heading to your next stage okay so a lot of will actually also happen um, next week all right, so let's actually quick run down about the things that's going to happen uh, before the semester end. Okay, any questions? Okay, now then let's get started. Then. All right, so in the previous lectures, okay, we talked about uh, what is atomic symbol, right? We use a lot about PR tables. And then so to understand what the um, atomic sim, how to write the atomic symbol first, okay. And then how we have to learn this so-called nuclear equation. So you know what the nuclei in radio decays, okay. What they actually under the decay, you know how to actually write or predict what will be the species that you are going to have, right? And then we provide this table mainly, okay, by calculating the n to d ratio, okay. 
if you know a nuclear lock is actually not stable, okay, it's going to undergo radio radioactive decay, then there are four different type of decays we can actually have. Okay. Then the most common question that will be encountered is that they give just give you an atomic symbol, right? And as you work on PK, you you are expected to have. Right. So mainly using this specific table to do all your prediction. Okay. So let's say the things we went through uh, last week. Okay. And we're also talking about how can you actually use the decay kinetics to understand the uh, decay, either decay rate constant or the half life time of a substance, right? So for all these calculations, you can usually always calculate using uh, atom numbers instead of the mass, right? So we also need to actually convert the mass into the atom numbers. Okay, so you will know what's your initial amount of atoms, what is actually the amount of atoms, especially time t. So you can just plug into this equation to do all your calculations. Okay, so this is actually a quick summary of all the things we went through last week. Okay, so what we are going to do today is actually want to okay do the things called the the one of the most famous things for the contents. That you if you are expected to do is actually to calculate the mass feedback. Okay, so mass feedback is actually for atomic symbols. You know you have how many uh, proton you have, how many neutron you have. Okay, and scientists actually determine how heavy a proton is and how heavy a neutron is. Okay, so we typically use one amu to represent the mass of photon or neutrons. Okay. And then if you calculate by using the AMU method okay, and your atomic symbol, you can get certain mass number. Okay. And then you compare to the mass number you determine experimentally. Sometimes you see some differences. Okay. So those mass differences is actually represent the conversion of the mass into energy. Okay, so in chapter 18, one of the most famous equation is this one, right? Delta E, which is the change of the energy, can be expressed as the delta M times C squared. Okay, delta M is actually the mass differences between the calculated mass and then the actual mass that you determine. Okay, so if you calculate that difference, you multiply the square of the speed of light, they will actually give you the energies that are going to be released through this uh, radioactive decay. Okay. So these are the, you know, the only calculation we are going to do for uh, the second part of chapter 18. Okay, the calculation is very much easier, but you want to be careful because the way we ask for the energy to be tricky, which we're going to go through that example so you can see all the possible possible uh, question type that you're going to encounter uh, when you do your homework or quiz for midterm. Okay, so that's pretty much the first part of chapter 18 they want to talk about today. Okay, so let's go through that example so that we can actually get the things done and then move to the second topic. Okay, so here is actually questions that we want to actually go through. Okay, so it says, let's say you an atom, which is IN122, has a mass of that many AMU. Calculate the binding energy, okay, in mega electron volt per atom. Okay, so let's actually first questions that you have. So the first question is calculate this binding energy as a unit of mega electron volt per atom. Okay. Second, mega electron volt per nucleon. Okay, per nucleon. And the third, mega electron volt per mole. Okay, so this is actually all just different units. Okay, but calculate the same thing. Okay. 
And then kilojoule per atom, kilojoule per nucleon, kilojoule per mole. Okay, so energy, if the unit of energy can either be mega electron volt or kilojoule. Okay, so it's actually energy unit. Okay, but you can calculate the energy per atom, per nuclear, or per mole. Okay, per mole means actually you have 6.02 times 10 to 23rd atoms. Okay, so those are the things that, all those are the combination that you can actually see. Okay, so the binding energy that we are talking about here, okay, is actually that delta E equals to delta M times C squared, okay? The delta E is actually so-called the binding energy. All right, so how do we calculate this, okay? So we want to actually calculate the delta M first. Okay, so delta M is actually the first quantity that you need to calculate. Okay, so the delta M is actually, you calculate your M based on the number of protons and then number of neutrons, okay? Minus the actual mass. Okay, so in this case, the actual mass is this number, right? So 121.910280 AMU. Okay, so that is actually the first thing that you need to actually compute. Okay. Now you need to compute this M. Okay, the theoretical M. Okay, so the atom that you have is actually IM. 122, right? So you need to know the number of photons and the number of neutrons that you have, right? So what is the actual number of photons you have in the path? In that you use the QR table, right? Yes, so the number of photons is actually 49, right? Because it's, yeah, I can see you get, okay, so 49. Number of neutrons will be 122, minus 49, right? Which is going to equals to 73. Okay, so, you can see there's actually a lot of constant here, right? So all these things will be provided. Okay, so let me highlight this. Okay, so all this information, just a, a tons of constant, right? So lots of things will be provided in your returns. Okay, so if you look at this, a series of constant, okay, the first one actually tells you the mass of a proton. Okay, so you need to know that's actually the mass of your proton, right? H1, okay, atom is actually your proton. Okay, the mass of a single proton is 1.007825 AMU. Okay, so right now you have 49 of it, right? So let you know the mass, okay, it should come in from the mass of the proton, right? You have 49, and then you can multiply 1.007825. That's actually how many AMU coming from your proton, right? Okay, so similarly, you should do the same thing for your neutron, right? And here it says the mass of your neutron is going to equal to 1.008665. So this part is coming from your neutron. Okay, so by doing this calculation, you can actually calculate the theoretical mass to equal to 123.0160 AMU. Okay, so this is actually the theoretical one, right? So you need to actually put this number back to here, right? 
So if you minus that, you can calculate your delta m. Okay, so once you calculate delta m, you should get a value of 1.1057 amu. Okay, so any question for this? No question, right? Should be straight all right. Now I want to ask you a question. This value, 1.1057 mu, is that per atom, per nuclear, or per mole? Everybody understand my question? Okay, is it actually per atom, per nuclear, or per mole? Hmm? Where did you get the mass? The mass is for what? For atom, right? So this is actually a very important concept. For atom. Okay, so this is very important because if you don't know this is just per atom, you will get so confused when you try to answer the questions of all. All right. Okay, so then how do you calculate delta E? Okay, let's let's focus on this. Okay, finding energy in mega electron volt per atom. Okay, so delta E is equals to delta M times C squared. Okay, so here. I want you to actually pay attention to this conversion. Okay, it says what? It says one A and U is going to equal to 1.66 times 10 to the 27 kilogram. Okay, that's actually one conversion, right? So it's actually mass to mass conversion. Okay. The other unit you can have is actually. 1 mu is equal to 931.5 mega electron volt per sphere of light squared. Okay. Everybody see this one? Mega electron volt per sphere of light squared. Okay, C squared. Okay, so this means, okay, if you put these things in, right? So 1.1057 amu times c squared. Let's actually how you calculate your uh, delta e, right? You want to have the unit of mega electron volt. Therefore, we convert this amu into this. Okay, so what you're going to do is 1.1057 amu because we know one amu is. 931.5 mega electron volt per AMU. Okay, and then this AMU, like I would say, is actually AMU per atom, right? So I just make it actually all complete. Okay, and then so this mega electron volt. Okay, and then times C squared. Okay, and then you multiply the speed of light. Okay, so this and that is the same, okay? So what I did is I just put this guy, okay, to some unit conversion like this. Okay, so once you do that, AMU, AMU is going to cancel out. Speed of light square is going to cancel out, right? So in the end, what you have is one thousand twenty nine point nine mega electron volt per atom. Okay, so this is actually the first one, right? Mega electron volt per atom. That's actually how you calculate it. Okay, 
any questions for this? Okay, so if not, then the second question is you want to calculate the delta E as a unit of magnetic electron volt per nuclear, right? So what is actually your nuclear? So the nuclear is actually the total number sum of your proton and neutron, right? So how many nucleons you have in this? You actually have 122 nucleons, right? So all you need to do is actually to go from here to mega electron volt per nucleon, what you do is actually is delta E per atom divided by 122. Okay, so this will actually you become your delta E. Okay, you have mega electron volt per nucleons. Okay, so let's going to give you a number of 1029.9 divided by 122, which is going to give you a value of 8.4422 per nuclear. Okay, 8.4422 mega electron volt. So this will be actually the answer for the second question. All right. How about the third one? You want to know the delta E as a unit of mega electron volt per mole, right? So delta E mega electron volt per mole, right? So what you do is actually because right now the energy that you have here, 1.29.9 is a single atom, right? To convert into one more of atoms, okay? What you will need to do is just 1029.9, okay? Make an electron volt per atom times your Avogadro number, okay? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, okay? So you have the energy per mole, okay, and that will give you a value of 6.2 times 10 to the 26 mega electron volt per mole. Okay, so this is actually how you get this value. All right, so it's not difficult. The most important concept is that you need to actually know how to calculate the theoretical mass, okay, using the number of proton and then number of neutron. Okay, once you compute that, you can actually calculate your delta m, and that value is actually the mass differences per atom. Okay, then after it's just simply the unit conversion problem, right? So if you want to convert to an uh, mega electron volt, you can access directly from the AMU and then use this one to convert into mega electron volt. Okay. So with that being said, you right now you should also see that okay, so after you know one, two, three, right? The four, five, six is basically the same thing. You just actually use the Kilojoules instead of mega instead of using mega electron volt, right? So how do you actually calculate the things that have the kilojoules? Okay, you're going to use this. Okay, first convert your AMU into kilogram, and then multiply the speed of light. That number will give you the unit of joule. Okay. 
then you can start from there and convert into kilojoules. Okay, so that's the things we need to do now. Okay, so this is actually all for the mega electron volt, right? So now we want to actually calculate in the joules. Okay, so delta E is delta M is 1.1057 AMU, right? And then we know one AMU is 1.66 times 10 to the next 27. So once we do this, this will give you the unit of kilogram per for that AMU, right? Then you actually multiply the speed of light, which is 2.99792 times 10 to the eighth power. Okay, this would be square. Okay, so I got this value right here, right? That's actually the speed of light. Okay, so this will give you the answer, which is going to equals to. One point six four nine six times ten to the negative ten joules per atom. Okay, but the question is actually asking for the kilojoules, right? So you want to actually make it kilojoule, so it will be 10, 1.6496 times 10 to the negative 13 kilojoules per atom. Okay, so what I do is just multiply 10 to the negative 3, right? So this will be actually the answer. Okay, 1.696 times 10 to the negative 13 kilojoules per atom. Right. And then if you want to calculate the delta E, where you have the kilojoules per nucleon. Okay, what you do is actually 1.6496 times 10 to the negative 13, divided by the number of nucleon that you have, which is 122, yeah. Okay, so once you do that, then you're going to get a value of 1.35 two two times ten to the negative fifteen kilojoules per nuclear. Okay, so this will be the second answer. For the last one, if you want to have kilojoules or more, Okay, then you will simply buy, it will be 1.6496 times 10 to the negative 13 times the Avogadro number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay, so they will give you a number of 9.9307 times 10 to the 10th power. So they will be the kilojoules per mole. Okay, so question one is actually very simple, right? But the way it asks you, you need to be very careful. You should know exactly what is actually a unit that the question is actually asking for. Okay, and that's actually the part that confuses the most. Okay, because when you calculate delta m, many of students they don't have the concept that that delta m is actually the mass differences per atom, okay? But if you have that concept for this, it's becoming a just unit conversion type of questions. All right, so uh, any questions for this? Okay, so you're going to see a lot of these type of questions okay, when you do your homework or quiz. Okay, just be careful about the unit, okay? Okay, so the very last important topic that we want to go through for chapter 18, is the this part is actually nothing fancy. It's just a paragraph trying to improve your 
common knowledge about the nuclear power station. Okay, so the first actually talking about this particle accelerator. accelerator. Okay, so let's actually throw things that show up in your textbook. Okay, so in order to actually convert a nuclei okay, from one to another, okay using human design, okay, not the natural design. Okay. If you have force that to happen, okay. What we do is actually we create a huge big electric field to accelerate the atoms, okay, or the uh, the charged particles. Okay. The typical way we do is actually we bombard the atoms that we are interested, okay, with alpha particles. Okay. So From my experience, okay, your quiz and homework want you will actually ask you to know when we actually try to do this process. What are what is actually the specific particle we always use? Okay, it is actually the alpha particle. Okay, it is actually the key things. Okay, and then he has actually a very unique notation. Okay, so you need to know what the notation should look like. Okay, if you see this, okay, you see the atomic symbol X A Z. That's actually what you're going to start with, okay? And then it hit with alpha particle, right? And then it produce a neutron. Okay, so this symbol is actually represent this. Okay, your X, your X is going to hit with the alpha particle, okay? And then it's going to produce something else plus a neutron. Okay, so typically you're being asked okay, what is the Y? Okay, why is that the atomic symbol of the Y? Okay, so the key thing is that you know how to actually use the nuclear equations, right? Which we actually do a few practice in our previous lecture, right? So use this to compute what is actually new, what is that specific new element you are going to get. Okay. So that's something that you need to know. Okay. And then after that particle accelerator, the other very important things that in your textbook, specifically chapter 18.6. So P3. Okay, it's actually for your chapter 18.6. Right. So it basically actually tells you uh in the current nuclear power station, okay, what is actually the major mechanism we use to produce all those energy. Okay. So if you read through that paragraph, you should have a clear distinction. What is actually fission? What is actually fusion? Okay, so fission is actually you break one big particles into the smaller one. Fusion is actually you combine the smaller one into a big one. Okay, both approach can actually produce a lot of energies that we like to actually uh, acquire and use it. Okay, but the most important things that you should know that most of the electric power station is actually using the fission, not the fusion yet. Okay, so fusion is actually something human doesn't have a good control yet. Okay. And then inside layer, okay, you should know the basic structures. Okay, so the most important process is, is that you are going to have some nuclear radioactive material okay uranium 235 is actually the most famous one okay so typically you hit that uranium with a neutron make it become visible okay so it will start to actually break into a small particle during this process it releases even more neutrons and those neutrons will keep break the part of those particle continuously and during this process it produces huge amount of energy then we can enter harvest. Okay, so this process is actually, if you write the things on the paper, okay, it can actually unidirectional. Okay, meaning once you actually get going, you will get going really, really fast, right? But that's not something that you want to have because if you suddenly actually generate a lot of energies, those energy has no way to escape, right? So, what happened to that? Okay, it builds up and. 
it's going to have an explosion of your nuclear power fission. Okay, so it's not something that we want to have. Okay, so all this reaction was actually mediated by the generation of neutrons. Okay, so there's actually one thing called the control rod. Okay, control rod is actually the device that can actually specifically absorb the neutrons. Okay, so what we do is actually when you have too many neutrons uh, in your reaction chamber, right, and reaction is going to go too fast, suddenly you build up too much energy. Okay, what you do is actually you enter, you actually insert those control bar into your reaction chamber to absorb that uh, neutrons. Okay, because if there's no neutrons, your atom will actually do these uh, fusion reactions. Okay, then you won't actually generate more energies. Okay, so control bar is actually ready to mediate this reaction, okay, to slow it down. Okay, and then the keyword here is actually it's going to absorb neutron. Okay, so that's something that you will you will need to know. Okay. Okay. So the other thing related to this is that okay, so to make this nuclear power station to work, okay, you need to have all those in it initial material okay the most commonly used one is actually the u235 okay so this actually the one is we call it uh usable okay it's actually not feasible okay means actually we can just break apart and then let this uh nuclear reaction to go on okay but this the species of u235 is actually limited okay there's actually only very few u35 you can uh, discover them uh, in the nature. Okay, so let me actually there's actually a good chance you're going to be running out very soon. Okay, so to avoid that to happen, then human create another thing called the breeder. Okay, so this actually we start to have this breeder reactor. Okay, so what breeder do is actually I try to actually create U thirty U two thirty five from other species. Okay, so. Typically, for example, we can actually use something that's not feasible. Okay, for example, U238 is actually very stable. Okay, compared to U235. Okay, so what we do is actually, and the in nature, there's actually a lot more U238 than 235. Okay, so you actually get those U238 first, play into the breeder cells. Okay, and then you hit that U238. With some particles. Okay. You force them to convert it into a feasible particle. Okay. Something similar to the U235. Okay. And by doing this, you can actually make sure you have enough resource to uh, enough resource to supply for the nuclear power station. Okay, so those are pretty much all the key information that you need to know. Okay. So I just go through it so you can actually get the big pictures, go back and read your textbook, but these are the things that's relevant, okay, or important in the, uh, for your quiz or exam, okay? A few examples. Okay, so this is just one of the questions you probably will see in your quiz, okay? It's not giving a lot of statements. So it asks you about what the breeder reactor is, right? And then what the control rod is, and then what's actually the source, uh, the current format of source that we can generate using what type of reactions. Okay. So here it says, okay, which of the following statement is actually correct? Okay, the first one says the breeder reactor convert the convert the non-fissionable nuclei nuclei. U238 to a fission fissionable product. Okay, so this is actually how we can sustain, uh, how, this is how we can provide a constant material supply for our nuclear power station. Okay, so the, this one is actually a correct statement. Okay, the second one, the control rod in the nuclear fission reactors are composed of a substance that is not in mix, it's actually a salt, okay. So a salt is actually the only the you okay. It's a salt, neutrons, okay. 
Okay, so that's something that is super clear. Okay. The third one, electric power is what we generally use in the nuclear. Not fusion, right? But fission. Okay, so it's really just testing. Okay, what is your common sense for the second part of chapter 18? Okay, so we can just go back and read through section 18.6. Then this should be actually super easy for you. Okay. Okay, next one. Which one of the following require a particle accelerator? Okay, so every time you see this particle accelerator, right, the particle layer is going to be used to force the transformation of your particle. It has to be the alpha particle, right? Okay, so what you do is actually you're looking for the reactions that have these things in the under reactant side. Okay. So once you have that, then you can check out all these equations, right? The only one that have the alpha particle will be this one. Okay, so let's actually how you should answer the questions. Okay, so if you see this keyword, particle accelerator, alpha particle. Okay, looking for the equation for alpha particle, they will be actually your answer. Okay, so those are the key things that you should actually know for the quiz you're going to encounter next week. Okay. So it's nothing fancy. You you know it yet, then you know it. Okay, so that's actually pretty much all the content that I want to actually go through for chapter 18. Okay, so by now you should see that the most important part or most difficult part for chapter 18 is really, I guess, two things or oh, three things. Okay. First, if you have a radioactive particle we take what kind of decay you're going to have that one is actually uh, something that students always get confused right and the way you handle is actually using the table that i provide then you should be able to actually answer those questions quickly and correctly okay second decay kinetics there's only one equations that you can use right natural law at over a naught equals to negative kt right so that is always how you actually actually use to do all this calculation the key layer is that you need to actually use the number of atoms okay to do all the calculation okay if you do use that then you should all the calculations should be actually quite straightforward all right the third one is actually calculating the mass defect delta n right and then how you convert delta n into the binding energy delta e, right? So that's actually a third type of calculation you probably won't, you will actually encounter, right? And the way you solve that is actually to know when you calculate delta n, okay, the difference between the theoretical and the actual mass is actually a m u per atom, right? So once you know it's actually a m u per atom, then to calculate your delta E in different units should be actually quite straightforward. Okay, it's more about the unit conversion type, type questions there. All right, so any questions so far? So if not, then we're going to go to a few more questions, okay, from our review hangout for your return three. Okay, so I plan to actually go through two more kinetic calculations. Okay, from the uh, midterm three review hangout. Okay, so we can find all this hangout on pins. Okay, so there's actually only two more questions I want to go through here, so that we can check, get more familiar with the uh, kinetic calculation. Okay, so starting from question number eleven. Okay, it says the half-life of a beta, of beta decay of some atom is 28.8 years. Okay. Every time you see a sentence like that, okay, you should know that this has to be a decay kinetics property, right? 
right? Because the keyword half life is very specific. Okay, if you see this keyword half life, then you should know that. Okay, so you should know that the equation that you should use is really this. Natural log AT over A naught is equal to negative KT. Okay. Half life is actually a very unique word. Okay. What it means is actually your AT is equal to one half of your A0, right? So if you put the things into these equations, they become natural log one half is going to equal to negative. He says the half life is 28.8, right? So let's actually your T, right? So let's actually your T half. So this on the left side, you have natural log one half, which is actually a constant, right? On the right hand side, you have this negative K times 28.8. Therefore, you know, you can easily compute your K is simply equals to negative natural log one half divided by 28.8. Okay, so we're going to get a value of 0 0.0241. Okay, so unit will be per year. Okay, so this is actually the things that you can get from the first sentence. All right, and then it says, if you have a milk samples, it found to contain that much these atoms. How many years will pass before the things concentration drop to one ppm? Right. So this is actually a very standard things you test. You okay? Can you actually recognize the ten point three ppm is actually your initial conditions, right? So let's actually your A0. And then your final condition will be 1 ppm, right? And then ask you how long it will take. Okay. So again, you just go back to this equation again, right? Okay. So do you know your AT? What is your AT? One, right? So that you know, natural log on the top is actually one, right? What is actually A0? 10.3, right? Do you know your K? So you just compute your K, right? And then it's asking for your T. Right? So, Therefore, your T was simply equals to natural log 1 over 10.3 divided by 0 0.0241. Okay, so once you do that, you are going to get T is going to equal to 96.8 years. Okay, so that will be actually your answer. Okay, so it's really simple, right? It's always the equation. Okay, and then every single sentence is going to provide you some clue. Okay, so in this case, the first sentence tells you okay what k is, right? And then it actually tells you, okay, what's your initial, what's your final? Okay, tell me how long it will happen. Okay. It can also ask you, okay, if I give you my initial, I give you after certain years, as you calculate how many of that will be remains, right? So all of things can be tested, but it's always between these four variables, right? A, T, A, 0, K, and T. Okay. All right, so this is actually how you solve this type of questions. Okay. Any questions? If not, then... Number 12. A freshly prepared sample of certain atom undergoes 3312 disintegrations per second. 
After six years, the activity of the sample declined to 2755 disintegrations per second. Ask you what the half life of the this atom. Okay, so what the keyword? <laughs> Do, do we actually ever hear or learn about their things? So you see, it's actually the, I don't know, I feel like the, the, the person who designed the questions is a nerd. <laughs> Always create some like terminology that's actually not so familiar with, with not by students. Okay, so what's actually these integrations per second? It's not very clear to you, right? So what, if this is the first time you read this question, you feel like, okay, what, what, what is that? Okay. Okay. So, so the first thing, if you, if you are the one who see this, you will feel very confused, right? But how do you know that the question you should to use is still this one, right? So far, we actually always use this, right? Right. How do we know if we use this in coaching? Yes, okay. I like that keyword. Every time you see that half life, it's actually an indication then to use this equation. Okay. Very about are you by fine with this? Okay, make sure you actually see half life, put down this equation. All right. Now, once you know, you need to use this equation, okay? You want to review your questions again to figure out, okay, what are the things that it provides, okay? So it says these atoms, or you know you have this, you don't know what it is, okay? But the number is actually 352, okay? After six years, it becomes 27, Bye bye. Okay. So now you have four variables, right? A, T, A, zero, K, and T. I assume everybody has no objection that the six year represent your T, right? So this must be this guy, right? Now you start to say, okay. This species, this specific atoms, is start with 3255 in the beginning and become 2755 in the end. Okay. You only have three options, right? A, T, A, N, and K. How would you actually assign those two? Hmm? How many, of, how, how many of you will actually vote for K? Very few, okay. So this actually the time you have to actually make some judgment based on the common sense. Okay. Because you don't know what that this integration per second. Even though I don't know what this integration per second means, I would I will guess that is actually a unit of activity. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so I will guess this actually is something related to the activity, right? So in the activity, therefore I can actually use a concept to say 
if I have more of land, I'm going to higher activity. Less of land, I have low activity, right? So they will actually bring me to that this guy. Most likely is actually my initial. And that is actually my activity after that many years. Okay. Does this actually make sense to everyone? Because this is too far. I feel like I always get so confused because we never actually teach you what the, this equation per second means. Okay. So what I want to think about this is that every time you encounter those terms that you are not so familiar with, okay, consider that as the number of particles that you have. Okay, so if we translate language, what it says, what it really says is actually, in the beginning, I have 3,312 of that atom. After six years, I only have 2,755. Okay, so Yes. Okay, but this is actually the basic concept. Okay, activity is actually a keyword. What it says is actually whatever they describe in the beginning, okay, just a representation of how many atoms that you have. Okay, so once you have that concept, if what it says is actually in the beginning you have three, three, one, two, at the end you have two, seven, five, five. Okay, so you can actually plug all the things into this equation. Your A T is two seven five five. Your A zero is actually three three one two. Negative K. K is actually things that you don't really know, but you can easily compute it using this equation, right? So if you put all this number in, therefore you know your K is going to equal to negative natural log two seven five five over three three one two divided by six, okay? So once you do that calculation, you are going to get a value of 0 0.0307 per year. Okay? But once you go to this point, okay, Right. So you know your t half was simply equals to negative natural log one half divided by 0 0.0307. Okay, and once you do that, you should get a value of 22.6 years. Okay. So to recap this concept, okay, so when you read a question that you see some term they are not so familiar with, okay, 99.99% of the time is describing the activity of the substance, which can represent the number of atoms that you're going to have. Okay, so I think that's actually the most important take home message of this specific question. All right, and then every time you see half life, it is actually a hint that 
the only equation that you need to use is natural law a t over a zero is going to equal to negative k t. Okay, so once you have all this and spill up, this should be actually quite simple for, for you. All right, so I hope that is actually clear. Okay. Okay, so any questions for the things that we described uh, today for chapter 18? That's pretty much all the things I want to talk about for chapter 18. Yes. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. So if you look at the unit that we have here. Okay, so if I put in this, right, the T, if the T I put in, is has a unit of year, then your K will have the unit of per year. Okay. So when you go back to go down to here, this term, natural law, natural law by itself is what's the unit of that? There's no unit. Okay. So natural law inside is just a ratio, right? Your initial versus final, or yeah, your final over initial, right? There's actually no unit inside your log, right? The natural log term is actually unilast. Therefore, your t half, the unit of your t half will determine by your rate constant, unit of your rate constant. And the unit of rate constant is actually calculated using this, right? So for every t you put in, then the unit of k will have the inverse of whatever unit you put in over there. If I put in six seconds, then all this will be seconds. If I put in minutes, all this will be minutes. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, cool. All right, any other questions? Okay, if not, then that's it for chapter 18. Okay, then we can start to... Do you guys actually want me to continue for chapter 16? Or we can actually continue this the next lecture. Something new? Okay, so let's look at this one. Okay. Chapter 16, right? So what is chapter 16? So what did we actually learn in chapter 16? Give me some keywords. Okay, and energy. Entropy, yes, that's actually what I'm waiting for. <laughs> Entropy, right? So, um, let's let's read through this. The figure below represents a spontaneous reaction. Okay, spontaneous always a key word, right? So every time you see spontaneous, the things that you should have is actually your delta G is negative, right? What's the other thing that you have? Delta S universe is positive, right? Okay. All right, so those are the things that you probably actually should pop out in your mind. Okay, everything you see this key was spontaneous. Okay, not necessarily going to, we are going to use it actually here, but that's actually something that you should actually have in mind. Okay, so it says if I mix H2, which is the shaded, okay, so this is actually H2, with O2, which is this, this is actually O2. It's going to produce gas fast H2O, okay, this overall process is spontaneous. That means actually the energy of this process is negative, okay? And then you want you to predict if this is actually the reaction. Okay, I want you to predict the sign of delta S. Okay, it is delta S of your system, not the delta S of the universe. Okay, delta S, not delta S universe. Okay, so, and then you want to predict, okay, under, at high temperature and at the low temperature, will it be spontaneous or not? Okay. So this is actually a question that tests about whether you know your delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, right? 
So that's actually the key equations that you should always, always know. Okay. And when you say it is spontaneous, actually, at a specific temperature that you know, this whole thing is actually negative, right? Now, it asks you under high or low temperatures. Okay. Will your delta G become positive or negative? Okay, so that's actually the design of the question. In order to answer that, you need to know, okay, going from the left to right, do you have positive or negative delta S? How do you know you're going to have positive or negative delta S? So how do you predict the delta S? So, so key is here. So remember, when we talk about this chapter, okay, that's actually one thing we all say, okay, if I give you an equation, predict the delta S of lead reaction is actually positive or negative, right? So what do we do back to that time? What do we count? Yes, number of gas molecules. Okay, so if your product has more number of gas molecules, then your reactor, then delta S will be positive, right? Vice versa, if that's just smaller, then you're going to get negative, right? So now you actually just convert that equation into a picture. Okay, you can count the number of gas molecules here, right? So how many gas molecules do you have as a reactant? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, okay. 8 gas molecule, right? H2 and O2, they both are gas, right? How about here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6, right? So H2O is in gas form, okay? So here is actually very interesting. If you notice that it says the gas H2O, okay, that means actually all these things are gas, right? So let me actually on your right hand side, how many gas molecules do you have? Eight, right? How many gas molecules do you have uh, on the bottom side? Six, right? Therefore, your delta S is positive or negative? Negative, right? Okay, so now you know this. This is actually very important. This is actually key that you put the correct answer. Okay, so now you know your delta S is negative, right? Okay, so the second term, which including the negative sign, okay, negative T delta S, okay, this whole term will be positive or negative. Temperature is always positive, right? Delta S is negative, right? That's actually a negative sign here, right? So these three will give you a positive value, right? Everybody follow this? Okay. So if you go to very high temperature, what happens? This term will dominate, right? So if temperature is high, then negative T delta S dominates. Right? So if negative delta, negative T delta S term dominates, that make, will make your delta G become positive, right? So if delta G is positive, then not spontaneous. Right? So what if this tells you is actually the high temperature conditions, your second term dominates, your delta G become positive, then you will become non-spontaneous, okay? However, if your temperature is actually low, then your first term dominates, right? So delta H dominate. Or you can say negative T delta S not important. Okay, 
So in the questions, it always tells you, okay, for the for the current given temperature, this is actually a spontaneous process. Okay, that means actually this overall turns, okay, is actually negative, right? So right now you make this participant even smaller because you go to even lower temperature, right? Therefore, your delta G has to be negative, okay? Therefore, it will be spontaneous. Okay, so therefore the answer is that it will become non-spontaneous at high temperature and spontaneous at low temperature. Okay, so this is actually a very standard type of question to test whether you have this concept. Delta G equal to delta H minus T delta S. Okay, that's the first concept is test, it is actually testing. Second concept is that from the figures, okay, specifically from here, can you actually see that delta S is negative? Okay, so if you can see that, you can see how the temperature is going to play a role here. Okay? Yes. So at this moment, we don't know. We don't know yet, okay? But because in the question it says what? At this specific temperature, it is a spontaneous process. Right, and this actually, typically when we say this actually at the room, let's say at the room temperature. Okay, you say at the room temperature is already spontaneous. Okay, that means actually sum of your delta H and the second term minus T delta S, the sum at this temperature is already negative, right? If I can keep lowering down my temperature, which will make the second term less positive, therefore your delta will be even more negative. Therefore, it will be also spontaneous. Therefore, you don't actually even need to know the sign of your delta H in this case. Which is just because we were told at the beginning that it's spontaneous, so we can say that it's less than Yes, so they were spontaneous, they actually serve the purpose. So you don't need to even know the sign of your delta H. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is actually the things that you should really know. Okay, so based on the key here is actually, can you actually know the delta S in this specific question is actually negative? Okay, so any question for this? Mm -hmm. No questions? Okay, so if you don't have a question for this, I have one more question for you. Okay, so if today I flip this, Okay, meaning my reactor has six molecules, my product has eight gas molecules. Okay, how will I actually change your answer? It will always be spontaneous, right? Because right now the second thing is also negative, right? So, so it's really depending on the sign. The sign actually matters a lot. Okay, so you need to be 100% sure that you know how to know the sign of your delta S. Okay, then you combine with this simple concept delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Then you can just select out the correct answers presented in your, in your questions. All right, so I hope that actually makes things very clear. Okay, so if there's no more questions, I think we're also running out of time. And we'll stop here. We'll continue this discussion on Thursday. Thank you.